lives whiten stories. All right, is that what, can you give me, somebody give me a thumbs up. Is it, yes, okay. If, if for some reason when I'm talking, the slides do not advance, please somebody let me know because I had another situation in the past where I'd gone through several slides and someone said, oh, we're still seeing the first slide. Hopefully that won't happen in this case. So what I'm going to talk about this evening is um, related to the topic of our earlier conversation with the, the, especially the teachers talking about Wilmington and uh, the public historians on the previous um, on the previous panel, talking about what we are and are not taught, what, what kinds of stories are or are not told. And I'm going to focus my presentation tonight on my long history of working with and through the National Park Service. I'll come back to what the image on this first slide is later in the, in the conversation, but we'll focus tonight on the national parks. As you hopefully know, um, probably most of you do, North Carolina has 10 national parks. These are units of the national park system, all co-equal. Um, and uh, these are key parts of our public history infrastructure in North Carolina. Um, even though sometimes the National Park Service, we don't think about these as North Carolina sites, they are North Carolina sites. And what I'm gonna argue tonight and try to present is that three of these sites that I've worked on a lot are really um, making choices to present primarily white histories and missing opportunities or not um, taking up opportunities to talk about black history and to talk about honestly about topics about race that we need to understand. So I think the National Park Service you know, can and should do better in this score. And I would say this even at a moment when we recognize that there is burgeoning controversy and as we heard in the earlier panel, pushback on um, employees of various entities that try to do this. I think that the parks need to do better and they can do better. Um, I'm going to talk tonight about three parks in particular. Here are my three. And these are ones that I have worked on extensive um, historical projects at. We have Blue Ridge Parkway. We have the Carl Sandburg home in Flat Rock in Henderson County. And we have the Cape Lookout National Seashore. And again, I'm gonna focus on the whiteness of their existing storytelling, history telling, and what that tells us about the National Park Service and our need to look at and examine the whiteness of the National Park Service. Um, and how these parks could all choose to shift the narrative in ways that we need to and that would benefit greater understanding, greater inclusion, greater justice. So first I'll start with Blue Ridge Parkway. Um, this is the work for which most people probably know, um, know me as a scholar, certainly where a lot of my work on the parks began, all of it actually. But I feel like my Blue Ridge Parkway work has gone through numerous phases. Probably others of you that have worked on one thing for a long time could say the same. Um, I published a book with the University of North Carolina Press, 2006. Several years later, I led a digital project at the UNC libraries called Driving Through Time. And then uh, subsequent to that, led students in my public history courses at UNC in um, developing a, a web exhibit called the Unbuilt Blue Ridge Parkway, where we took up a whole bunch of things that I couldn't talk about in the book, basically plans that were proposed but never done. Um, and uh, in, the, in the process, I learned a lot more about things that I wasn't able to cover in the book. So the book represented what I understood in 2006, but there are new things um, to talk about that I have learned in recent years. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But one thing that I did realize in my Blue Ridge Parkway work, and this insight has stayed with me throughout all of my work on other national parks, was that the National Park Service, the agency, the federal agency, the, um, the manager of these uh, now over 400 national park sites around the country, um, likes to think of itself essentially as a transparent box that contains history. Um, very much like the image in this slide here, which was from the Blue Ridge Parkway headquarters, uh, the, the museum or the visitor center in Asheville. The Park Service wants to talk about history, it wants you to think that it's telling these histories out there, um, but that it is not a part of the story in any way. And it, that it hasn't affected the story in any way. Now, this was a problematic 
way of approaching history when I, in terms of Blue Ridge Parkway, and I could talk about that for a long time, but this idea is much more problematic and it seemed to me far more pernicious as I have begun to look at, um, at, to do other work and to sort of take up new perspectives and especially to pay attention to race and history. And I've done several other projects since my first iteration of Blue Ridge Parkway, they're shown on the slide here, um, that have caused me either A, to think about the National Park Service as an institution, and that being the Imperiled Promise Study that I was the leader of with the Organization of American Historians, or um, some of the projects that some of you are also familiar with that I've done on the built landscapes of UNC Chapel Hill and also East Carolina, East Carolina. University. In all, in all of those cases, I was really called to think more about the racism, the kind of the white supremacy and the way the landscapes had been shaped by the politics and hierarchies of the time and the way the institutions had been shaped. So this thinking has been important to me. And then carrying forward from that with two new projects that I have been working on more recently um, that have been funded by a pot of money that the National Park Service has had since about 2016 under the general rubric of civil rights. This image is not exactly the, the program that the money comes through, but it's related. But the Park Service has had money for projects done internally by the national parks and externally by community and other organizations to focus on African-American history. And two projects have come my way under that money that have really directed me to focus on um, new questions uh, in, on to focus on African-American history and to go in some new directions with new sources and new topics that I wasn't initially trained uh, to work on in my original graduate work and my original work on Blue Ridge Parkway. So it's really turned me around. And then this has been happening, of course, in the context of um, the national reckoning around race. And I don't need to list for you all the things that have been happening um, to, to bring us to this point. We know what these are, but this uh, has uh, also been in the air around as I've been trying to think about the national parks and think about race in the national parks in new ways. And I would definitely commend to you this book, How the Word is Passed, which is focused on public history and race. Um, we just started listening to it. It's very timely for our current moment. So these have transformed my work from the point of Blue Ridge Parkway One and have really brought me to a point um, in, re in regard to thinking about the National Parks and the National Park Service uh, that many other people have come already come to with regard to other cultural institutions and educational institutions. There's been a movement afoot that has um, th this uh, sign on the left here is representative of to, do, to declare and to make it clear that museums are not neutral institutions, that they are shaped, that they have a politics that they include and exclude certain things. So museums are not neutral. There's a movement about archives not being neutral. Certainly higher ed is not neutral. And I would say the National Park Service and the national parks are not neutral either. And that the transparent box that I originally thought about with Blue Ridge Parkway, the sort of sleight of hand that moves the National Park Service out of the scene in terms of the park services and the parks history telling, uh, has actually had a long had a racialized character that needs to be protected. That parks overrepresent and have over um, over told primarily white stories, even without acknowledging it, and that they have silenced um, many highly relevant, relevant, interesting, and important stories of Black lives, in particular park spaces, and of racial power dynamics um, and white supremacy in fact, that we need to understand. Uh, the Park Service is entangled in those systems of racism that we're all, all trying to think about with regard to our institutions. So the Park Service and the parks are not neutral. So what I would like to do now is to take you through the two projects that I've been working on more recently um, with the uh, civil rights funding that has um, hired historians and researchers to do all kinds of projects across the park system currently. And the two parks that I'm going to talk about, one, are, one is the Carl Sandburg home in Flat Rock in Henderson County. The other will be the Cape Lookout National Seashore. So first of all, the Carl Sandburg home. Now, again, if I could see you all in person, I would be saying how many people have visited the Carl Sandburg home? 
Um, I can't really do that in this environment. So I'm assuming that many of you have been, been there and know about it, but I will give a little pricey in case people have not. The Carl Sandburg home in Flat Rock consists of uh, this building here is the barn that is uh, the goat barn. There is also a large white house. Um, and this is the property that uh, with about 250 acres of land that Carl and Paula Sandberg purchased in the mid 1940s and moved to North Carolina from Illinois to um, mainly because Paula Sandberg raised a certain variety of goats and they needed a large acreage on which to have Paula Sandberg's goat farm. So they purchased this property in the 40s and moved to North Carolina and he wrote uh, you know, books and poetry and she ran the goat farm. And in the mid 1960s, the National Park Service was beginning to look around. They were on a certain um, tear about getting uh, new parks developed that represented various aspects of American history and culture. There's kind of a whole Cold War thing going on with the Park Service. But anyway, they wanted to uh, bring in new park sites that had to do with culture and literature in particular. And uh, the Sandbergs had gotten to know someone in NPS. And anyway, upshot is Carl Sandberg dies in 1967. Paula Sandberg sells the site to the National Park Service, packs her bags and moves to Asheville and leaves the entire thing um, for the National Park Service. So it becomes a national park in 1968 with the purpose of interpreting the last 20 years of Carl Sandberg's life. Um, and that really has been the thrust of it in, in terms of the interpretive program. You go there now, you learn about the Sandbergs, uh, you learn about the goat farm, um, you learn about his writing. They have lots of programs on his uh, folk music, um, poetry, writings, literary focus. But this site had a long history before the park and it had a long history before the Sandbergs ever arrived. Briefly, the site as it's sort of configured now uh, dates back to the 1830s when the house that's still standing there and many of the outbuildings that are still on the property and this particular acreage of land was grouped together and purchased by a South Carolina white attorney named C.G. Meminger, Christopher Meminger. And he owned the property um, until uh, that he died in the 1880s. It was then sold to uh, another South Carolinian named William Gregg Jr who was involved in the textile industry in the South, in South Carolina. Um, and then when uh, Greg died and his widow sold it to a third South Carolinian named Ellison Adger Smythe. And Smythe owned it till he died in the 40s and then it was sold to the Sandbergs. So there's a longer history before the park. That's the overview of the Carl Sandberg home. What's the project here? So um, this project is done jointly with my husband, David. A historical Society member. He's out there on the call. As much of my historical consulting work with the Park Service has been in recent years. And so he and I together were hired by the National Park Service and the Organization of American Historians to work on a what they call a historic resource study on Black history at the Carl Sandburg home. So that meant we were charged with looking at the period before the Sandbergs arrived because the Sandbergs didn't really use a lot of any particularly much, if any, hired labor on the site. So most of the black history on the site is going back to the Memminger period. And here's the picture of David and me as we were venturing out across Aiken, South Carolina to try to learn some things about uh, William Gregg and the second owner and his family. So we were hired to look at black history and we have finished the project. And this is the the study here, as you can see, I've taken the title of tonight's talk from the study. You can download it and read it online if you like to. Um, and, and we completed it this summer. So doing this study was a real challenge, however, because we, to, in order to talk about black history at the Carl Sandburg home, we had to uh, remove or get around some other layers of primarily white stories. One of them is the layer of Carl Sandburg, obviously. Um, the National Park Service had made an explicit decision to talk about Carl Sandburg at a site that had a lot of other histories. And that then meant that the physical landscape was treated in certain ways. And it also meant that certain sources that we would have found useful um, Went, went cold or were lost in the time since the park was created. 
And so it, we had to kind of get around the Carl Sandburg framing because the Carl Sandburg framing doesn't sit very well with the site's other history. That's one challenge. And then the second challenge is to get around a pervasive local white centric mythology that enshrouds the town of Flat Rock in North Carolina. If you have visited Flat Rock, you have probably heard any number of people say, Flat Rock was always called Little Charleston of the Mountains. Well, in the doing of this project, David um, took a deep dive on the idea that Flat Rock was Little Charleston of the Mountains and really looked into what kinds of messaging that contained within it and where that phrase came from. And so far as we could tell, the phrase was invented in the 1940s by a woman named Sadie Patton who wrote a book on history of Henderson County. She was a member of the UDC. You know where this is going. And this is really talking about Charleston, kind of having Flat Rock live in the reflected glory of uh, the wealthy elite in Charleston who built, um, uh, who built, who came to Flat Rock in the time when Meminger came and built these summer homes that were grand and they brought culture from Charleston and these estates and homes still live yet and they had all of these aristocratic trappings um, and this is what little Charleston of the mountains is. And this, this gloss has been over Flat Rock and the, 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 the narrative has been around in Flat Rock since the 1870s, even though they didn't use that phrase. And that's what this newspaper article shows here. Um, but even the park had adopted this unquestioningly as somehow the true history of Flat Rock. Again, this made it hard to see black history because this is a certain framing of Charleston. Yes, folks came from the low country, but um, it not, this does not capture what is meant by Charleston. So we had to get around these two stories. And even the park knew that they were not being entirely honest about the history of the landscape. When the scope of work came to David and me for this project in 2017, it had this uh, short um, section in it regarding this structure here in the picture which is known as the Swedish house, which is the Sandberg's name for this structure that was built in the 1850s. And the park realized that by adopting a Sandberg framing for the whole site, that this has, as they said, silenced the fact that the Swedish house built under the Meminger um, ownership for the, uh, for the housing of enslaved people, that, that was being silenced by paying, only paying attention to Sandberg. So the park knew that it, uh, it needed to get out from under these white stories. And that's why they hired us. And so what I'm gonna talk about now is some of the transformative insights that we have found in the study and really uh, the, the stories that, that are fascinating that this park could be telling, that could talk to us about slavery and the Civil War experience and Reconstruction and Jim Crow and black communities and lives. There's so much potential here that is um, being deadened by the focus only on Sandberg. So some of the findings. First finding was essentially that Flat Rock, which was, as I mentioned uh, briefly before, developed in the 1830s by a number of wealthy white um, families from the low country in South Carolina involved in you know, various plantation activities, rice planting and other activities in South Carolina. Those were the people who built homes in Flat Rock in and after the 1830s and spent time there seasonally. Um, so this is a, a, a process that many of these low country families had been doing in other places like Pendleton, South Carolina, before they discovered Flat Rock, there'd been lots of upcountry getaways, but that is who developed Flat Rock. Um, that is who built these homes. And so with some student labor and student workers in my public history class, we looked at the about 50 pre-Civil War landowners, property owners in Flat Rock. And it, we found, not surprisingly, that these people were well-connected to large and wealthy slave-owning, slave-holding families in South Carolina. Here on the left is just a short list of some of the property owners in and around the area. One is in Fletcher, but the others are in Flat Rock and the number of people they enslaved in 1860. These make, this makes some of the Flat Rock's part year residents, some of the largest slaveholders in Western North Carolina, certainly. Um, and so this is a wealthy, powerful slave, slave owning community that develops in Flat Rock. 
Two of the members of the community, uh, CG Memminger, our uh, person at hand here with the with the uh, Sandberg property, CG Memminger and George Trenholm were treasurers of the Confederacy. Um, and all three of the Flat Rock property owners, Memminger, Greg, and Smythe, were variously interconnected to South Carolina networks of wealth, power, slave owning, industrial development, and other stories. So this is the community that came to Flat Rock. And C.G. Memminger himself, the park had never really looked deeply into his involvement with slavery. He was himself an enslaver of numerous people as seen here in the, what we gleaned from the census. Um, and there is also some detail in the Memminger papers, which are at UNC in the Southern Historical Collection about um, what some of the enslaved people may have done, the role that they played in, in, in supporting the family as they moved back and forth from Charleston to Flat Rock seasonally. The records for the Memminger property are not very good compared to other plantation sites that I know about that have extensive um, detailed records. It's not the case, but there is a ledger, and that's what's pictured here, that does give some detail about particular people by name, enslaved people, Robert, Morrow, Cupid, who are doing particular things for the family. So that's Memminger himself as an enslaver. But we looked more broadly. Memminger was very involved in the financial and legal uh, systems um, that were around slavery. Here recently, I've just found out about slave mortgages, people using, which is not surprising, and I know that many of you probably already knew this, but I was trained as a 20th century historian, um, enslaved people as property being used for collateral on various loans. And Memminger here in this document, there's a whole set of these on family search, um, is, uh, is the grantee for 46 enslaved persons mortgaged by Thomas Lamar. He was an attorney to other people who were buying and selling and willing enslaved people. And these records show that uh, a bill of sale for 66 enslaved people. And on the right, um, Memminger is the uh, trustee or the, uh, sorry, is managing the estate of someone who has a number of um, enslaved people being, uh, being parsed out in the estate. And then, as I mentioned earlier, Memminger's face is on the Confederate money right here as um, the first treasurer of the Confederacy. So Flat Rock is really a center of you know, Confederate ideology. And then as we see here, we find this um, address as he's part of the development of the ideology around slavery, where he is talking about African slavery is consistent with the moral and physical process, progress of a nation. So C.G. Memminger was in slave, involved in the slave system up to his eyeballs. A second theme that we found was that there is a story of the inner civil war that is often discussed with North Carolina history at Flat Rock. There is a, a United States Army soldier who was, in, uh, who was um, imprisoned in a prison camp in South Carolina. He escapes and with the aid of some um, African-American people he encounters on the way near Flat Rock and also with the aid of a white family that worked for the Memingers, they hide him and they help him to get on to freedom. And this man wrote uh, this memoir in 1898 that describes the Hollingsworths who worked for the Memingers and who sheltered him uh, and some of his, uh, one or two others who escaped with him as they were escaping the um, prison camp in South Carolina back to Union lines. So there's a whole discussion. Why are the Memminger employees, what is their feeling, uh, the, the white families that are not wealthy about these wealthy, slave owning families in Flat Rock. There are several stories that could be told at this site about reconstruction um, with the, the Freedom's Freedmen's Bureau, the resurgence of uh, former Confederates into power and suppression of black political power. I'll just mention briefly, C.G. Memminger spent the end of the Civil War in Flat Rock um, and his property, his home in Charleston, pictured here, but it no longer stands, was uh, it was taken by the um, United States Army and then the Freedmen's Bureau and turned into uh, an orphan asylum for black orphans right after the end of the war. And um, this was, I think, one of two uh, asylums that the Freedmen's Bureau developed for black children. C.G. Memminger was incensed by this um, turn of events and did everything he could to try to get his property restored, which it was. 
shocking um, as he was able to get a pardon under Andrew Johnson's pardon uh, policy and his property was returned. And what became of the orphans? Who knows? They were kicked out and Memminger got his uh, home back. And C.G. Memminger um, himself was part of the group of former um, Confederates re-elected to power in South Carolina in 1876 in the so-called rest, what is it what's called rest, restoration, but, um, when redemption, what is it called? Um, when former Confederates retake power in South Carolina. We could also talk about in, ter in terms of reconstruction, the third owner of this property, Ellison Adger Smythe. There's a lot to say about Smythe. Um, he, his family through the Adgers was well connected to big slave owning families in Charleston. He himself had been a Civil War veteran. Um, uh, he had owned the Greenville paper and he had started several textile mills in late 19th century South Carolina at Pelzer, South Carolina at Balfour. And David did a lot of this research on this section looking at um, how these mills treated black workers. But Ellison Adger Smythe, it turns out, was also involved as a leader in the red shirt movement in South Carolina that was part of intimidating um, black citizens who were trying to exercise political rights. That's never discussed at Sandburg now to the degree that they ever mention Smythe, they just call him an industrialist. And then, as I mentioned before, you could also talk about both Smythe and Greg in terms of their work in um, and their family's involvement in, text, in the development of textile industry in the South and the black white interactions, the opportunities, the exclusions um, in industrial systems that these two uh, subsequent owners after Memminger were involved in. We also found quite a bit of information about black lives and communities in and around Flat Rock. Lots of things to say here, prominent local business person, um, Simpson Dogan, uh, 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 black owned societies that were developed to support and provide mutual aid to black citizens, community organizations, employment, terror and lynching. Lots of details that could be discussed there. And then to our surprise, the park had wanted us to talk about individuals. To, they had a list um, and then we developed a further list of I think about 30 or 40 um, black names of people who had been somehow associated with the site. And they wanted us to find out what we could about individual life histories. I was not sure when we started that we would be able to, but clearly I had not been heavily involved in genealogical research before because I was shocked. But with the, the new resources coming online through Ancestry and Family Search, the digitized um, census records, death records, wills and estate records, Freedmen's Bureau, digital newspaper, city directories, you name it, they're all uh, these records are listed here that we consulted. We were able to put together a quite amazing set of individual stories, especially about a number of Black employees who had worked for the Smites, either in Greenville or um, when, when the Smites were still coming to Flat Rock seasonally or after the 1920s when the Smites moved to the site full time. And these are just a few examples on this slide of some of the individuals that we were able to find, um, possibly a formerly enslaved person who was then working for the Memingers. This is in the Freedmen's Bureau records right here. Um, a, a person named James Fisher, who was a longtime employee of the Smites, who had been a World War I veteran. There's a whole story about him and then his family in Flat Rock. Um, a person, an enslaved person who had gone to war as the, as the servant or slave for Smythe. And then there's a whole story about this pension system that South Carolina developed later. And then uh, uh, several prominent families who were sort of second generation in Flat Rock, Black families, the Simmons family and the Markley family who were connected with this site. Lots of individual stories that can be told here and can be found. These people had fully realized lives um, and it's possible to begin to bring those forward. So what is the park doing? I really think the Sandberg site is receptive to our study. They commissioned the study. They had known that there were other things they wanted to focus on, but they have some challenges looking ahead. The challenges consist partly, as I mentioned before, of the fact that the park was established because of Carl Sandburg. That is the establishing legislation, which is on the left in this slide, um, focusing on Carl Sandburg. That's the story that was legislatively designated for the park to tell. And then secondly, they do have to contend with a continued powerful, wealthy white community associated with Flat Rock 
a group called Historic Flat Rock that was founded the same year as the park and still essentially trades in Little Charleston of the Mountains house tours and that sort of thing and euphemistic references to enslavement um, that tend to appear. So the park has got to deal with that if they really want to take the park in new directions. But I'm hopeful and we're somewhat hopeful that they will begin to do. The second park I want to talk about here is Portsmouth is the Cape Lookout National Seashore. And in particular, a section of Cape Lookout National Seashore called Portsmouth Village. Again, I would ask you if I could see you all better, who has made the journey to Portsmouth Village? Bill Richard has, yes sir, yay. Um, and I'm sure some of the others of you have too, but this one is harder to get to than the Carl Sandburg home. You have to be a bit more determined to get to Portsmouth. But what is Portsmouth? Quickly overview. Portsmouth Village is, was a community um, chartered in 1753 by the colonial um, government in North Carolina. And uh, it, it existed as a community where people actually lived until 1971. In its early days from the 18th and 19th century, it really was a community to um, support shipping through Ocracoke Inlet. So Portsmouth is at the north end of Cape Lookout National Seashore, right across the Ocracoke Inlet from the town of Ocracoke. And Portsmouth was there to help support shipping in a number of ways at the time when Ocracoke Inlet was the major passage point for um, commerce through the Outer Banks. And um, the support included uh, a number of things such as lightering and piloting, guiding ships through the inlet or unloading heavy cargo so ships could lighten up and get across the inlet and then reload and go wherever that was they were going one side or the other. In 1842, 1,400 ships went through Ocracoke Inlet. This was a busy, busy passageway for ships in and out to the Atlantic and then into the inner coast of North Carolina in that time. Um, so its heyday was the pre-Civil War period when there was a population of nearly 600 people uh, before, the, before the Civil War. After the Civil War, a rapid decline, and a lot of that really was because there had been a hurricane or more than one prior to the Civil War that had opened new inlets north um, in the Outer Banks and Ocracoke began to show up and become less prominent as a transshipment point. So after the Civil War, a lot of the population did not return. There was a consistent decline over time, a turn to other occupations, fishing, sport hunting. There was a life-saving station out there, but it's really a story of hurricanes, decline, and growing isolation over time. And by 1971, there were three residents that were living out there most of the time. One of them, who I'll speak about later, passed away. The other two moved and the site was um, incorporated into the relatively new Cape Lookout National Seashore at that time. And so if you go today, you have to get a ferry to get over there. And what you will see are an assortment of buildings across this fairly um, you know, desolate landscape. Um, it's, it's beautiful, but it's an abandoned, uh, abandoned village of mostly mostly very late 19th and early 20th century buildings dating uh, from that latter period of Portsmouth's history. So what was the project here? The project here, uh, which I'm not doing with David, but which I'm doing with two colleagues, one from Appalachian State and one from East Carolina University, uh, was to also funded under the civil rights money that the Park Service has had for park projects. This one was to update or amend the Portsmouth Village National Register nomination to include African-American history, to focus on African-American history. For those of you who, who, which I know there are people here tonight who do know a lot about the National Register, you will not be surprised to learn that when Portsmouth was put on the register in 1978, the nomination was very short and mostly focused on the white community at Portsmouth. And it focused hardly at all on the fairly large enslaved community that made the work of that uh, town possible in its pre-Civil War heyday years. So the thought was to develop a so-called area of significance around African-American history for this site. As you all may know, also very few sites on the National Register of Historic Places highlight African-American history. And so this, we went out there, we had some, we had some uh, archeological ex explorations. We had some students from both ECU and Appalachian working with us. And as you can see in the middle, depending on when you go to Portsmouth, you can find yourself pushing the park vehicle out of the water um, as a part of your historical project. So we went out there several times. What, the National Park Service's current chosen stories for Cape Lookout and Portsmouth in particular also 
come from a primarily white perspective. Pictured here are two interpretive panels from the relatively new uh, interpretive exhibits that were installed in the little visitor center building. It's, it's one of the historic buildings at Portsmouth. These were installed about five years ago. So these are not old, um, but as you can see, if you can read these at all, um, they highlight uh, kind of generically, there's this towards the island way and that um, we would come to know people who chose the hard but rewarding island way of life. There's this whole sense of this isolated community that some people somehow persevered in. And that's primarily a white story about the 20th century. As you see on the right though, even when they are talking about the 18th or 19th century, they really elide the importance of slavery at this site. The picture doesn't really seem to convey the fact that at times, as many as a third of the population was in, were enslaved, and they talk about in the in the site in the sign they will um, mention enslaved workers, but they talk about other people migrating there looking for opportunity, uh, and there's not a sense that a large part of the population was coerced to live and work here, and that race is generally deproblematized. I will come to more about that later, but the current story focuses on, it, it, to be sure, largely the 20th century, because that's the physical environment that's left in a way, and that is what the park has, that is the story the park has decided to focus on. But if you go into the historical record, as we have for this, and you get beyond um, only paying attention to the built environment that remains, African American history is abundant through the historical record. And again, these digitized records that are coming online through um, Ancestry and Family Search and various archives around North Carolina, um, including you know, deeds and Freedmen's Bureau records and other things. And we also have some material culture in terms of work that's being done in archeology, span uh, you will begin to develop a much more full picture of what P Portsmouth was really like and this research is very exciting to do. And it's been exciting for me in a way to bring the 19th century close in a way that it never was for me before. So let me take you through a few of the findings out here um, in, in terms of uh, African-American life and history. First of all, slavery, a clear picture of slavery at Portsmouth would show you that um, enslaved people always made up a significant proportion of the population, but this did wax and wane over time in certain ways. For those of you that are very familiar with North Carolina's maritime history, you will recognize the name John Gray Blunt, who was the um, businessman and, and speculator and um, enslaver located at Washington, Little Washington. He was in partnership with someone with a business operation called Shell Castle in the Ocracoke Inlet in the uh, late 19th and very early, sorry, late 18th and early 19th centuries up through about 1810, 20. And in that time, there was an installation actually in the middle of the inlet that he and a partner at Portsmouth named Wallace were trying to make money off of. And they were um, serving these ships with all of this lightering and that I, that I mentioned earlier in the, and that required a lot of labor. And during that period when Shell Castle flourished, the enslaved population was much larger, was higher percentage of the population than it was at other times. And that story, the whole story of Shell Castle is completely ignored or mostly ignored out there, but could really be focused on. And Shell Castle here, um, in terms of slavery at Portsmouth, most of the enslaved people in Portsmouth's early years were owned by various members of the Wallace family. There was a Wallace that was in partnership with John Gray Blunt um, and other Wallaces who had been early settlers at Portsmouth. And they were the people who first developed Portsmouth and first dominated the sort of business enterprise out there. The picture on the right is, a, is essentially the advertising uh, bling that you gave out to you gave out to customers in the uh, early 19th century. This kind of picture, you would have it printed, and as you can see on the front, it's printed view of Governor Wallace's Shell Castle. This was the set. This is the only view existing of this installation out in the inlet, where um, where enslaved people were working and helping to load and unload these ships and manage all these ships coming back, and where John Gray Blunt and John Wallace were trying to make money. Uh, off the shipping coming back and forth through Portsmouth. 
that that is on display at the North Carolina Museum of History and I about fell out the time that I went over there and saw it. It's, it's a remarkable piece. By the 1850s, however, the major slave owners at Portsmouth were the customs collectors. There are two particular individuals who were the customs collectors at, um, uh, at Portsmouth, and those were the people that owned the, the largest groups of enslaved people by the 1850s and 60s. When Shell Castle had gone away, and much of this shipping was shifting to another, to the other inlets north. There are some notable trends in terms of women slave owners at Portsmouth. You can trace these people through wills and deeds and uh, family lines, and you end up with a number of widows and women owning enslaved people. I think there's more of a story there than I've been able to find, but it's important to highlight. Also notable that high percentages of the enslaved at Portsmouth by 1860 were children. And so it's very clear as you look at the records that the, they have to do with this very kind of constrained community there. You can see what's happening and you can see that enslaved people were bought and sold and hired out and rented and inherited and families were divided at Portsmouth. That's a story that you could tell. And I think you could tell it with some degree of detail given that there's a relatively constrained number of families and you can trace over the years what is happening to um, the enslaved community at Portsmouth. You could also talk about the resistance of enslaved people at Portsmouth. Just this one example found in the newspaper of 19 people that tried to escape in 1831 by a ship that got caught in a, um, in a storm and this failed. Finally, in the Civil War and after, I just love this image from 1861, which shows Portsmouth. This is Oak Cove Inlet. This is um, Fort Ocracoke in the inlet on Beacon Island. And right down here in the back is Portsmouth. You can see what a little metropolis it was. It is vis visible on this drawing. But what happened to the enslaved community after the Civil War? I don't have clear answers to this, but I think some people could begin to discuss it. A New York Herald reported that a ship went by in 1861 and saw so-called contrabands, I guess enslaved people waving white flags at Portsmouth at that time. There are a number of possibilities. I'm sure people that are more knowledgeable about Eastern North Carolina, the refugee communities, the black community at James City, New Bern, could talk more about this or could help me to trace this, but I was excited to be able to trace one named individual born at Portsmouth, um, enslaved to David Wallace Sr. to into New Bern after the war. I think there's more that could be talked about there. And then finally, the one African-American piece of African-American history that does remain on the land and that is focused on quite heavily at Portsmouth is the story of Henry Piggott. He was one of the three final residents in 1971 and it was his death um, that made it impossible for the two remaining white women who were the other residents to remain on Portsmouth. He dies in 71, the other two women move and that's the end. But Henry Piggott descended from the one African-American family that returned to Portsmouth after the Civil War. And um, there is a tendency at the park to focus a lot on harmony uh, in racial history in Piggott's family as an example of that. People talk about how beloved he was on the island, um, but it, there is also uh, evidence and it is mentioned briefly at the site that you know the school on Portsmouth was segregated and Henry Piggott was not able to go to school. So I think there's a way to use this story um, as a hook for a bigger story that goes back into slavery, that talks about why people came back and why they didn't and what kind of environment this was um, racially. But the park kind of punts on that right now. Beyond Piggott, the landscape and the historical record um, don't match very much. As I mentioned before, the historical record, of course, most important in the 18th and 19th centuries, very important. Its physical landscape is mostly a 20th century landscape. The National Register prioritizes the built environment. So that does make what we're doing challenging, but we are also talking about the landscape. And the park faces a challenge of climate change, which may make a lot of this moot as far as telling any story on the location in the future. You can see even when it rains, uh, how bad the water is out there. But what is, what is a park to do when the physical landscape doesn't represent the history fully. You can't make it represent the history fully. Um, and there are also at this park constituents in terms of descendants, mostly white, of the 20th century community who are very invested in Portsmouth. 
So those may make challenges to reconfiguring the story of Portsmouth Village. Finally, I'll come back and hopefully not too long to my, to my uh, first part, which is Blue Ridge Parkway phase four. I gave a talk on black history on the parkway and I'm working on an article about this now. I'll briefly take you through a few things because I'm aware that time is running short. As most of you know, if you go to the parkway and think, try to look about history, most of the story that the park service chose to highlight on the parkway landscape is a essentially um, stereotyped vision of Appalachia uh, as a, 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 an area where white rural pioneers lived in uh, log cabins and carried on traditions long after they were dropped elsewhere. There's just cabin after cabin and the hand of the National Park Service in creating these scenes was very heavy on the parkway landscape to the degree that they took out other um, evidence of other stories at many points. And so the silencing of the past is, is pretty profound here. But you could look at black history on the parkway if you took it in four different sections. Quick run through this. You could look in the parkway region, black history before the park. You could look in the National Park Service story. How did National Park Service plan for black visitors? What about black labor in building the parkway, maintaining the parkway and working on the parkway? And finally, tying into our earlier discussion, racism, whiteness in North Carolina and how white supremacy um, threads have woven their way into the parkway's history. Y'all know that I love maps. If, if anybody knows my work, I made a little map. If I were in charge of park interpretation, here's all the little sites where I would put up exhibits to talk about black history on the parkway. There's a lot of locations where it could be done. I can share the PowerPoint later if you'd like to play with this map at all. There are a lot of opportunities here. But first, with black history in the region, very easy to talk about the fact that Appalachia has not ever been and is not now all white. There are stories of enslavement, there was slavery in every Appalachian County and there were considerable black populations in every, in many, in, in every Parkway County, but in many of them listed here as I've listed on the eve of Parkway construction. The domestic slave trade um, carried on routes crisscrossed the mountains. There are many sites where you could talk about these histories. There is a, a, no, a number of cemeteries that are known to uh, have enslaved people buried on the Parkway. There is a story of black um, property ownership, farming, land ownership. On the right is pictured the Saunders Farm near the Peaks of Otter in Virginia. And you could talk about black labor and wealthy white enclaves. The Moses Cone Estate near Blowing Rock, part of the parkway, the Cones employ black workers at the site. You could certainly talk about black history before the park there. Second, you could talk about the National Park Service and the planning about facilities for black visitors or not. There is a little bit of discussion of this on the landscape now. The park has put up one sign at Cumberland Knob shown here that talks about the five campsite, the five picnic tables that were set aside for black visitors in the 1930s. And it wasn't marked, but rangers were going to direct um, any black visitors that came to the segregated section. And this represents the fact that in the 30s and 40s, the Blue Ridge Parkway, along with the rest of the National Park Service was um, engaged in developing and planning for segregated facilities, visitor facilities at many national parks, especially in states where there were Jim Crow laws and, and practices. At Blue Ridge Parkway, there was a lot of planning on this, a, not a lot implemented because the parkway started in the 30s, the war came and by the mid 40s, the late 40s, the park service had desegregated. But there are plans throughout the archives. This one here, you can't really look at it in detail, but um, was a plan for a whole uh, blacks only recreation area at Pinesburg, Virginia. This is near uh, milepost 144. And there's a lot of new work being done about park service policy on segregation, integration. There's a whole study being done on Virginia. Um, there is a, a lot of there was a lot of conflict in the Park Service and in the Department of the Interior about how parks would handle um, segregation or not, or what would happen for black visitors. And it has been pointed out that Park Service policy under Arno Kimmerer, who was head of the Park Service at the time, tended to say, oh, well, we'll just wait for demand before we develop any facilities for black visitors. But it was noted that that kind of logic was not applied to white visitors. In any, in any case, um, the parks were not very inclusive uh, for, and the Blue Ridge Parkway did include plans for segregated facilities, although very little of it was done. At Pine Spur, this is for basically it, 1941. We've got two swing sets and two picnic tables. It never went much further. We were at Pine Spur earlier this week. 
there is exactly one picnic table currently there. The rest of it is just an open overlook. Um, and it's not marked at all. And there's no discussion of what the plans were for this area originally. The other place where there is something on the landscape that we could talk about is at Downton Park in the bluff, what was called the Bluffs when the park was early developed. There was an actual picnic ground that was created and built for black visitors there. It's shown here in 1940 down these steps to picnic area number one. This is the where I started the presentation tonight with the slide. It was called the Woods Picnic Area. It was for black and white visitors, but this was the only area that black visitors could use. White visitors had to use the or could use the picnic area on the um, on the big uh, on the on the bluff where you could actually see a view. This was in the woods. It's behind the coffee shop if you've been up to the to the Downton Park area now. And it was the area for black visitors to use until the mid 1940s was abandoned in the 1960s. This structure was built in 1942 and still stands. This was what it looked like in 2008 when David and I visited the park. And this is what it looked like in 2020. The park is has a facility here, has something on the landscape that could be talked about, where they could talk about Black history, where they could talk about the race, racism of the National Park Service, where they could talk about the Park Service being implicated um, in segregation. And instead, it's just falling into the ground. If you went now and parked here at that same parking lot pictured earlier, you would not know it's back there. And on the right, you can see the picnic tables falling into the ground. Other pro proposed facilities for black workers and black visitors were mostly not built. And there's a whole conversation to be had about park service plans in the 50s and 60s for more lodges, which met some opposition to people <clears throat> by people who feared that it would be, it would bring integration. I'll go a little more fast here, black labor on the parkway. There was an all black CCC camp in Virginia. Black workers obviously hired to work on the parkway by the 70s, including <coughs> a, a black park ranger here pictured who I've later learned was a school teacher who worked seasonally for the park in the 1970s and lived in Asheville. And finally, we have to talk about the way various famous white supremacists that we've talked about earlier in the night <coughs> excuse me, also were involved in the parks story, in the Blue Ridge Parkway story. Harriet Clarkson at Little Switzerland, uh, involved in the red shirt movement, involved in the late 19th century white supremacy movement, an, an attorney from Charlotte. He was a, a major opponent of the parkway route, but, but had a shaping influence on the parkway route at Little Switzerland. Obviously, Hugh Morton, the owner of Grandfather Mountain, was the grandson of Hugh McRae of Wilmington. And then a major hero of the Parkway story is um, Josephus Daniels. Without his advocacy for the Parkway, as it was conceived by North Carolina, North Carolina might not have had the much of its route around Asheville and to the, into the park and the Great Smoky Mountains at the far southern end. <coughs> Excuse me. So Daniels is a hero of the early Parkway story, but as we know, he was also one of the architects with Hugh McRae, with Harriet Clarkson, of the late 19th century white supremacy movement. So these folks were still on the land and they were involved in the Parkway story and the park is not really talking about any of this. And there is um, finally to bring Josephus Daniels back, there is a Confederate memorial on the Blue Ridge Parkway. 125,000 trees planted by the United Daughters of the Confederacy dedicated in 1942. <coughs> this is near, um, <clears throat> Uh, the, the Devil's Courthouse at milepost 422 in North Carolina. Josephus Daniels gave the dedication speech in Asheville for the Confederate Memorial Forest. A student of mine has written a whole article on this that's linked here. I'm happy to share these slides if people want to read more. This is my last slide. I love this picture. This is in the Parkway Visitor Center in Asheville when you go. The idea they quote from the early landscape designer is to put the parkway as if nature put it there. There's a way in which the National Park Service wants you to think that all the parks are as they were if nature put it there. But the fact is that the National Park Service has had shaping action at every park, Blue Ridge Parkway, every other park. It has chosen things to talk about and it has silenced other histories. It is not neutral, it has not been neutral. And we need a reckoning with its overemphasis on white stories and its silencing of black history in regard to the other histories and in regard, regard to the Park Service itself. And since North Carolina National Parks are a key part of the public history landscape in North Carolina, 
I think we as North Carolina historians should push the parks to tell a more capacious, inclusive and honest history um, of our state. I think there are real opportunities here to make the national parks more inclusive spaces, um, but we need some courage and the, we need to help the parks have the courage to uncover and tell these stories and talk about self-reflexively the park services own development and evolution in regard to uh, equity, justice and inclusion in this country. <laughs>